bring in from the White House, uh, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders. Sarah, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so uh, what's going on with the president and Iran? Uh, look, the president's been clear from the beginning since the first day he took office and even before that nuclear, nuclear proliferation was something that he was not going to tolerate, something he would aggressively stand up and talk about. Uh, and he's certainly not going to listen uh, to aggressive leaders from other countries and the, their empty threats against America. And he's going to stand up and make sure that we're protecting Americans and certainly protect uh, the world from nuclear pro proliferation. It's something he takes seriously, and uh, he's going to continue to be tough on this topic. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what kind of a threat from Iran would, would allow our president to respond, and what kind of a response would that be? Well, as you know, we're never going to broadcast what uh, actions the president may or may not take or what specific actions is going to prompt him uh, to take things a step further. But you can be rest assured uh, he takes this process extremely seriously. Uh, he's monitoring and watching the actions of Iran. And um, if needed, he will take what steps are necessary right. to protect people in this country and certainly to protect the world from nuclear pro proliferation. Sarah. We've been on the couch the entire morning, so we have not necessarily seen this because we're not watching other media. But you can be sure mainstream media is going to attack the president for his all caps tweet saying he's inciting a problem with Iran. What's the president's response to that? Uh, the only person that is inciting anything is Iran. The president uh, has been very, very clear, again, since day one, what his objectives are. And he's certainly not going to tolerate the leader of Iran uh, making threats against Americans, making threats against this country, uh, making threats against Israel. This is a president uh, who is going to stand up and make sure he is doing what is necessary. He's showing peace through strength. Uh, but if, if needed and steps are required, this president is not afraid to take them. You know what, uh, Sarah, this is, kind, this is somewhat reminiscent of last August uh, when the president was going back and forth with Kim Jong-un, uh, calling him little rocket man. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong-un was uh, saying some uh, derogatory things as well. But then eventually the president talked about fire and fury. You know, you better look out. Or you, fire and fury coming your way, which ultimately led to direct talks with Kim Jong-un. Is that part of the game? Is that part of the equation? Maybe, the, you know, this tough talk will lead to some sort of agreement? Uh, look, the, the president certainly uses tough language, but he's also not afraid to take tough steps if necessary. Thankfully, uh, it didn't come to that with North Korea. Hopefully it doesn't come to that with Iran or anyone else. This is a president who wants to see peace. This is a president who wants to work with other world leaders. This is a president who wants to bring people together. But at the same time, he is going to do what is necessary to protect Americans and, and to make sure that he's laid that out very clearly. I don't think there's any question uh, what Donald Trump's uh, idea is here is that he's going to do whatever is necessary to protect Americans. Sarah, let's talk about the FISA warrant application. Congress has been asking for this. Republicans in Congress have been asking for the unredacted form. Well, Judicial Watch, uh, through Freedom of Information Act, they got this, and it's 412 pages. If you start flipping through it, you can see all the redactions. Well, Congress sent a letter. You have 13 Republicans in Congress, uh, led by Devin Nunes. Trey Gowdy was part of this. And they sent a letter on June 14th to the president saying, can you please get the unredacted FISA application? We want to see what it all says. And they have the ability to do that. We as a, Americans can't, but they have um, confidentiality status where they're able to look at it all. Do you think the president's going to get involved? Will he demand from the DOJ, look, you need to hand this over to Congress? Look, the president wants transparency in this process. Uh, I think what you can see even just from the, the information that has been released is that the president's been right all, all along, that this is uh, a total waste of time and certainly a waste of taxpayer money. His campaign had nothing to do uh, with Russia, but had everything to do with a great message uh, to defeat Hillary Clinton. And that's exactly what this camp that campaign was focused on. And that's exactly what this president has done since he got into office. And I think we'd all be a lot better off if we could get this out of the way and that Congress and the special counsel could come to the same conclusion that the rest of America has, that this is a, a hoax and a waste of time. And let's move on and focus on some of the big problems and big challenges we actually have to face as a country. Well, is he not asked for it because he just doesn't want to get involved? 
uh, look, that, that remains to be seen, but I, the president would like this to operate independent of him, but he certainly has asked for the Department of Justice to be transparent in this right. process. Uh, and if there are questions, which clearly there remain to be some, we hope that they'll step up and help answer those questions. I want to get to something that's uh, right up my sleeve, because I'm the one that Fox & Friends sends out to do the stories on Made in America products. The White House is going to show off Made in America products at the White House today. Uh, this is a great thing that you guys do. Uh, it's an incredible event. Uh, hopefully the weather will get a little more cooperative throughout the day because uh, I know there's some big products that will be out on the, the South Lawn later this afternoon. But it's, it's a great moment uh, for our country. You get to see some of the greatest products that the world has to offer that are made right here in America. It's another reminder of the president's focus on American workers, the American economy, and creating American jobs. And this is going to be a great event and a great showcase. It's something we did last year and we're really excited about uh, seeing all the great products from all 50 states again here this year. That's right. I just got an email from my friend uh, Tim Tyler who works for Viking Range. Uh, they, they build them down in Mississippi. They said they're going to have a Viking range there. Uh, do you imagine the president's uh, going to get uh, a lot of feedback regarding the tariffs and trade talk? Uh, look, again, the president has been uh, extremely focused on making sure we're doing everything to protect American workers and to grow American industry. And this event is exactly another reminder of that focus of the president. I, I don't think that that will be the big topic of conversation. I think the fact that the economy is booming and growing like never before, that we have a better job and market and job environment that we've had in decades, I think that'll certainly be something you hear talked a lot about. And maybe, just maybe, we could put that Viking uh, range to you, Steve. I know you got a yes. new cookbook. If you get some free time, maybe you can <laughs> pop down here this afternoon and we can uh, make some pie or some other. Uh, she loves making a pie. Out of your book. Pies, what she I was going to say, Steve, that's a good contact to have. Can you give us all his number? <laughs> no kidding. Viking's a great company. All right. Well, Sarah, good luck with the activity this afternoon. I hope the rain holds off. For more on all this, let's bring in New York Congressman Lee Zeldin, a Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, joins us live in studio. Thank you for being here, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. I want to first get it out there. This statement from Ambassador John Bolton on Iran. Uh, this, as we continue to see more response from the White House this morning, saying, quote, I spoke to the president over the last several days, and President Trump told me that if Iran does anything at all to the negative, they will pay a price like few countries have ever paid before. This war of words seems to continue. Continue to escalate even at this moment? Well, first off, it, it's important that as you go from President Obama and Secretary Kerry and their approach to Iran to President Trump to Secretary of State Pompeo, Ambassador Bolton, uh, that it, it's important that we correct the position that we are negotiating with Iran because we were assuming a position of weakness. Uh, John Kerry, in a way, was auditioning for the role of president of the Tehran Chamber of Commerce in, the, in his approach to Tehran. Uh, we were, in negotiating the JCPOA, we were concerned about dates, but the other side wasn't. We were saying that uh, sanctions relief was going to be phased in over time based off of compliance. The other side said sanctions relief would be immediate, no suspensions. Uh, so what you had rhetorically while all of this was going on, uh, Iran is threatening, chanting death to America, calling us the, the great Satan, calling Israel the little Satan, pledging to wipe Israel off of the map. And when they unjustly imprisoned our Navy sailors, remember, our response was thank you. When they were released, we were not reprimanding Iran. So now you move from one administration to the next. We want to reassume a position of strength. The military option is real. We say we can't be silent, not because we want war, but because we want to prevent it. Uh, and that was one of the mistakes that was made in the past was that we were allowing Iran in their streets, on their holidays, in their parliament to be talking about destroying America. And now we're saying if you want to engage at all, whether it's with us directly or with other countries, that there's a way to do it. And we are not going to tolerate you talking about wiping the United States of America off of the map. There's no, there's no tolerance for it. And there's a new sheriff in town. So we heard uh, Mike Pompeo Sunday. We can cue up a little bit of what he said in a moment here. But... but Pompeo went first, the Iranian president went second, and the president last night overnight with that strong, strongly worded tweet went out third. Um, th this was a big topic heading into Helsinki. This is where President Trump and President Putin talked about, we do believe, uh, about getting Iran out of Syria and really cranking up the pressure on Tehran to battle back their, their, their hardened position throughout the Middle East. So when you consider that right now, we'll hear Pompeo, we'll ask you how effective they can be. Okay, here's the Secretary of State. The level of corruption and wealth among Iranian leaders shows that Iran is run by something that resembles the mafia more than a government. Assad, 
Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, Shia militant groups in Iraq and the Houthis in Yemen feed on billions of regime cash, while the Iranian people shout slogans like, leave Syria, think about us. So this president's not going to stand for the rhetoric, certainly, but the rhetoric's been out around there for decades. And you have to think the Iranian reaction is in part reaction to what Pompeo's saying, and in part reaction to the buildup for the summit in Helsinki. The, the, it's also important who we're standing beside. So where the last administration was propping up the wrong regime with a jackpot of sanctions relief, what Secretary Pompeo is saying is that there are millions of Iranians that want a better future for their country. And we're going to stand with those people who are they're preaching. They want a free, stable, democratic Iran. They look to the United States. They look up to what we have. So we're going to stand with them. When people say that the most moderate uh, candidates get elected in, for, to the Iranian government, they often forget the fact that the 12,000 most moderate candidates aren't even allowed access to the ballot. So we're not going to prop up the wrong regime anymore. And the other thing that Secretary Pompeo was saying, with regards to all of Iran's bad activities that are non-nuclear, that we're not going to just turn a blind eye to it and allow them to get away with it, no consequences. So when they illegally test fire intercontinental ballistic missiles in violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions, in a way that is nuclear, but overthrowing foreign governments, financing terror, trying to build a land bridge uh, to, to Israel. Uh, there is a, you know, instead of treating Israel like Iran and Iran like Israel, we're treating Israel like Israel and Iran like Iran, and we are not going to tolerate uh, Iranian I think aggression in the region. All sides are engaged right now. We can agree on that. Yeah, well, Let, absolutely. Let's see where it goes. Yeah. Sure. Meanwhile, i uh, got to ask you, but uh, being a New York congressman, what is happening with the Democratic Party and the rise of the Democratic Socialist? Obviously, referencing Ocasio-Cortez, um, Bronx and Queens. What are, you, what are we witnessing happening with, with the Democratic Party here? The Democratic Party is getting exposed. You're hearing people critical of the approach of this new incoming member of Congress, assuming that she wins in November. And they're, they're criticizing her for maybe not waiting her turn or not being friendly enough to Joe Crowley uh, or you're not helping our cause of trying to regain control in, of the House in November. But what they are not doing is substantively criticizing her on the policies that they disagree with. So when she talks about free everything, free health care, free housing, free education, free everything, they're not a, asking a, a lot of free. <laughs> Yeah, they're not questioning um, her substantive. But Bernie Sanders and she, they were in Kansas City. They were in Wichita over the weekend, bit of a tag team operation. Here's Bernie Sanders first, and I'll ask you about this. She ran an extraordinary campaign. And the reason that she won is she ran on ideas that were relevant to the working people in her district. She put together a strong grassroots campaign and she worked her tail off. They, that may be true about her district and the issues and the ideas she appealed to, but you've got a big pushback from those in the moderate left who are saying this is not who we are. Now, how is this now contested over the next three and a half months? These are, this is the rank and file, the people who will be setting the agenda if the Democrats gain control of the House of Representatives. There are people who agree with what she is saying, but they don't have the courage to say it because they know how badly it polls. So while it's important to talk about the fact that Nancy Pelosi becomes Speaker of the House, Maxine Waters becomes Chair of the House Financial Services Committee, these are the people with gavels. Well, this is the rank and file electing who has the gavels, and these are the people deciding what the agenda will be. Uh, but I would say that a lot more than the, just this one woman, Congress is filled up with Democratic members of the House and the Senate who believe everything that she's saying, and the, the, you can see the, the proof in the fact that none of them can are I, can I show you something from New York New York magazine cover just came out last night early today Elizabeth Warren a picture of her running and then they have the question front runner is she uh, you know, I guess that would be great news for for every <laughs> supporter of Donald Trump I you know the, the Democratic Party if they are electing they are nominating Elizabeth Warren then they are going to be outside the White House it, for a heck of a lot longer it's amazing this the AP wrote up a, a piece this morning Democratic socialism urging in the a, uh, surging in the age of Trump they know 42 people running for offices at the federal state and local levels this year with the formal endorsement of the Democratic Socialists of America they span 20 states including four Florida, Hawaii, Kansas, and Michigan. And their supporters are unabashed about it. I mean, I, there, was, there was one video that came out of, of someone who happens to be opposing me. He said he's running against Lee Zeldin because he was struck by all the parallels between Donald, the rise of Donald Trump and the raise, rise of Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany. All across the country, now, now they're saying if you would disagree with a person, 
the person's a Nazi. If you disagree with their policy, it's now a Nazi policy, which is offensive. I mean, I happen to be a Jewish guy myself, but regardless of whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, their tactics to oppose on everything and anything, I believe, is also turning off a lot of independent voters who want to see us work together to get stuff done. Here's Ocasio-Cortez in her own words, why she won. Listen. The factors that ultimately created our win was the fact that we had bold commitments, and I campaigned on hard commitments of Medicare for all, tuition-free public college, ensuring a Green New Deal for our future, and championing those issues were the reason that we won. We won across demographics. We won. We expanded the electorate. How does that sell? You're in a district, you won 52-44, right? It was, yeah, we, about eight points? We, got, uh, we won by about 18 in, uh, in the, the last time out in 2016. And I'll say that what might sell in that district in Queens and the Bronx, that's not selling out on the east end of Long Island. And all across America, the, the districts that uh, the Democrats are targeting, the districts that Nancy Pelosi needs to win if she wants to become Speaker of the House, none of what you just saw and what she is selling works in a district like mine. Interesting. Uh, last point here. James Comey fired off a tweet over the weekend. Here it is, okay? Democrats, please, please don't lose your minds and rush to the socialist left. This president and the Republican Party are counting on you to do exactly that. America's great middle wants sensible, balanced, ethical leadership. There's a lot in that. I mean, he's urging folks don't go too far to the left. But I thought James Comey was a Republican, wasn't he? Uh, you could say in the past tense, uh, yeah. right now he has now gotten to the point where he's a Democratic operative. He's monetizing it. For Democratic his own operative. Yeah, he's monetizing it for his own personal gain. But I would say that he's talking to people who actually have already lost their minds. And he really, the pitch is to come back to the middle. It's not that they are on, you know, at risk of going that way. They went that way. One, one, one direction that they did go was to um, cry, abolish ICE. And it seems to be a message that, that they're sticking with, at least for now. Yeah, and it's the, it's the wrong message. Remember, July 4th, they spent protesting ICE, calling for the abolishment of ICE. Uh, you know, I, was, I spent July 4th celebrating America's independence. That's what Americans were doing all across our entire country uh, with parades. Uh, we were celebrating the, the sacrifices of those men and women who protect our freedoms and liberties. They spent it going after ICE. And, you know, where their party is seeking to abolish ICE, I'd rather see our efforts go to abolishing ISIS. It's two, you know, very diametrically opposed approaches to a foreign policy and national security. Also from New York, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, she's doubling down on these calls. Listen to this. When we flip the House and flip the Senate, I think the first thing we should do is deal with the children who are being separated from their families at the border. We should, uh, I, I think we should get rid of ICE. Immigration is our strength. It is our diversity is what makes this country and our economy so strong. Hmm. Yeah, well, basically that means that they need to stop talking about the efforts to defeat MS-13, I guess, uh, combating drug trafficking, sex trafficking, 